Grace and peace be with you through our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. You see, the context for our gospel text today is the trial before the Jews. You see, this trial was before the Sanhedrin, and that's the highest court of the Jewish law system. And it's the setting, but what about the timing? You see, our text tells us that after two days it was the Passover. See, that timing is very significant. You see, because at the Passover, it was not only a time of great expectation of the Messiah, but Jerusalem would be packed and crowded with messianic expecting multitudes. The Passover was a time to remember when God raised up the great deliverer and freed Israel from foreign oppression. It was a time of great patriotic and messianic anticipation. You see, every possible preparation was made for the Passover. You see, for a month ahead of time, the meaning of the Passover would have been explained in every synagogue and Jewish school so that no one would be unprepared. And as pilgrims streamed into Jerusalem, they would have noticed that every tomb near the road had been painted and freshly whitewashed. That was to prevent the Jews from accidentally defiling themselves by brushing up against a tomb. Interestingly, every male Jew who lived within 50 miles of Jerusalem had to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And many more would come from great distances, including Galilee. And I imagine that the people who had come there had heard Jesus or saw Jesus in the region of Galilee there, probably with great respect and great expectation regarding Jesus. You see, but our verses 1 and 2 tell us a very different story. You see, the religious leaders... They didn't seem to be respecting Jesus. They didn't even seem to be afraid of justice. For we will soon hear about the mockery of the trial and the rules they broke, just so that they could push Jesus out of the picture so he doesn't interfere with their status quo. They didn't want him interfering with their life. Isn't that a paradox? As we go on our Lenten journey, we see also that the religious leaders were afraid of failure. See, failure of losing their way of life, failure to concede power of religion and hand it over to Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't teach like them, and they were afraid that their lifestyle would have to be changed on account of Jesus. But yet, isn't that exactly what Jesus wants us to do? For our way of thinking is not the way God thinks, but he wants us to live like his example and to love the Lord. He gives us that commandment, right? And you should love one another just as I have loved you. You also love one another. You know, it's difficult for people to change. We look through history. At times we have people trying to say that, you know, people can change. They just need, for example, a better education. Or maybe they just need more money thrown to fund programs to support them. Or they might argue that over time people might eventually change. But friends, our gospel text shows very clearly that the religious leaders who themselves were actually slaves to the Romans who were actually in charge of Jerusalem and the region, the slaves were then holding a court as if to seek justice. Isn't it a paradox that Jesus wants to set us free and yet he's the same one who is standing trial? You see, as the chief priests and the scribes plotted the murder of an innocent man, it showed us that they didn't fear God. Nevertheless, they feared people. Friends, do you fear people? Let's look around us. You know, maybe we're trying to please people. Maybe you're afraid of something that others might say about you or think about you. Do you live for the praise of other people? Do you think that people control your day or your future or they have power over you? You see, People don't determine who you are. People don't determine your destiny. God does. You see, maybe you've been involved in a court. You see, I have. It's a traffic court, so don't start thinking too deviously. Interestingly, it's perhaps better to be just like Jesus and not say anything when you are in court. Because I remember this teenager who had been speeding and trying to justify everything in front of the judge only to 
get a bigger sentence. And it kind of made sense, right? Because it was a young driver, inexperienced. So the judge was really throwing the book at him so that he would learn his lesson. Was he innocent? Was it unfair? But if we talk about innocence, we can look at our gospel text. You know, I wonder the reaction that would have happened today if the actions of the court and the soldiers and the people around Jesus who beat him and mocked him and bruised him and tormented him. You know, such actions by the police today would result in a million dollar settlement by the city and given to the victim, but not in Jesus' case. You see, where were those who would stand up and defend the innocent? Who was asking for justice in the case of Jesus? Who was making a GoFundMe page to bring awareness? You see, where people are to rally for justice of the innocent, of the disadvantaged. Our gospel text tells us that Jesus kept silent and answered nothing. You see, certainly Jesus could have mounted a magnificent defense here, calling forth various kinds of witnesses on his behalf for the people that he had taught, the people that he had healed, the dead he had raised, the blind who saw, and the, perhaps the demons even themselves would have declared who Jesus is. But friends, Jesus opened not his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Such was the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. You see, Peter had abandoned Jesus. In fact, the disciples were gone. Peter was at a distance. It was interestingly, almost like a distance from God. You see, Peter was warming himself by the fire and was surrounded by people. You see, perhaps Peter was closer to people than to Jesus. You see, friends, are you siding with Christ? Or are you hanging out with the crowd and depending on the light of men and the warmth of human power? You see, consider your Lenten journey. Do you pursue the things of Christ? Or do you want Jesus, to stand in for your trial, for all have fallen short of God's standard. You see, this is the one key statement of the entire New Testament. It falls within the most powerful explanation of salvation by faith alone, through the grace of God in the Bible. But anyone can put their faith in Jesus Christ's death on the cross to save him. They have to believe and understand that first, they are a sinner in need of salvation. You see, Paul teaches us that the glory of God is the standard, and no one but Jesus Christ has ever come close to meeting it. You see, this is why, in order to be saved, we must have Christ trade places with us. He was totally righteous and never sinned. In the transaction that takes place when we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth, his righteousness is imputed on us, and our sinfulness and disobedience is imputed on him, so that he can die our death on the cross and become the curse for us, in order to lift the curse from us and the world. You see, friends, because Jesus is the innocent lamb, that's another paradox, isn't it? Because that trial proposed to seek justice. But the gospel texts tell us fully that the witnesses couldn't even agree. It's interesting in Jewish law that two witnesses are required to bring any kind of statement against someone. And such didn't happen in our text. You see, the witnesses couldn't make any conclusion. They couldn't agree. They couldn't concur. And such is the truth or falsehoods of men and government. They just try to gain position. They look at the tactics of the high priest. You see, when he noticed that the trial wasn't going his way, in fact, no charge was being brought against Jesus. The Jewish law, in fact, protected accused people from incriminating themselves or testifying for or against themselves. But our gospel text shows how they continued the mockery. It was clear that Christ had been proven innocent up to this point. But the high priest would not have needed to draw something out of the accused if there had been sufficient material evidence presented. But see, the trial had been a complete failure up to that point. 
and the high priest knew it. And now he attempts to bully the prisoner, Jesus Christ, and to extract some declaration out of him to save all this trouble about witnesses. Isn't it interesting? In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, friends, only gods can ride on the clouds. And Jesus made it clear to the court who Jesus was. Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, Jesus is the I am. And they would have known those words from Exodus. I am the door. I am the way. I am your helper. I am the wind. Remember the Red Sea, how the Lord saved Israelites using the wind. And I am the bread of life. And I am the light of the world and the way and the truth. You see, friends, turn your hearts and minds to Christ. Maybe you're faced with challenges. Maybe it seems like there's many doors that are closed. Maybe you're thinking there's a dead end or a promise or a dream is never going to come true. Maybe you've tried and tried, but it just seems too difficult to keep dreaming about that things will turn around. You see, when you think things that don't go your way, Jesus is the door. God opens doors, even the tomb. Let us go there. Friends, come with me as if we're inside a tomb and we can practice our social witnessing. We must conclude then, if we weren't able to stand up for Christ when others around us were dismissing him, then we should be more diligent and try to be more earnest about how we bring honor and glory to God. You see, if men had been so eager that they could dismiss Christ and to bring him shame, then we should be ten times more eager to go out. Let us no longer deliberate on how we should go, but we should find inventive ways to go and serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.